evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening um, for our Prehabilitation um, Expert Explore series. My name's Claire Cochlin. I'm the Clinical Lead at Bowel Cancer UK. Um, and I'm delighted that we've got two fantastic experts this evening um, who are going to do a question and answer session on prehabilitation before treatment for cancer. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speakers to you this evening, our experts in prehab. So I'd firstly like to introduce Professor Tara Rampal. Um, Tara is the Managing Director of Quest Prehab and a consultant anaesthetist at Princess Royal and King's College um, Hospital um, Foundation Trust. Um, Tara is a leading global export, sport, expert and thought a leader in the field of cancer and surgical re prehabilitation. She's contributed wisely, widely to raising awareness of the benefits of prehabilitation and advocates for making it accessible and embedded into healthcare systems. So thank you very much, Tara, for joining us this evening. And um, we're also joined um, by Roberto Laza Cajias, who is the operations lead um, for Quest Prehab. Um, I'm very fortunate, I still work in clinical practice and many of my patients have uh, benefited from uh, Roberto's expertise. Um, he has six years experience in designing and delivering prehabilitation programs um, for patients with cancer. He's currently a PhD um, MPhil student um, in human sciences. And his research is focused on the effects that multimodal prehabilitation has on patients with cancer and type 2 diabetes who are awaiting surgery as part of their cancer treatment. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Claire. Good evening, um, everybody. Now, before we start, um, we have got a couple of polls, but before we start that, I'd be really grateful if you could just give an overview. Everybody on the webinar this evening has been sent um, your Expert Explores video ahead, but it would be really helpful, I think, if you could just give a brief overview of what prehabilitation is in case anybody hasn't had a chance um, to watch it or just as a refresher. Um, sure. Um, so cancer prehabilitation, I'll be calling it prehab from here on because it's easy on the tongue. Um, it uses the time, the pre-treatment time, that is the time from the diagnosis of cancer to the acute onset of treatment to start putting in interventions which are targeted and personalized to your particular clinical scenario so that we can reduce the impact on functional capacity, on psychological um, and physical health outcomes uh, during the cancer treatment. So it's building up your body to take on the challenge of cancer treatment. And it can be chemotherapy, it can be uh, radiotherapy. Majority of prehabilitation has usually though has been studied in surgical treatments. Um, and in a very short last sentence, it's often been compared to training for a marathon. I personally don't agree with that because usually the analogy is that if you wouldn't run a marathon tomorrow without training for it, so you get your body ready to deal with it. Now, if you run a marathon, there's a finish line. And what we don't want after cancer treatment is to have a finish line. We want long survivorship and healthier lives. So always look at it as preparation for climbing Mount Everest, climbing the summit of your favorite mountain. You can pick up K2, Kilimanjaro. It's climbing the summit and then having the enough strength and energy for coming down and then carrying on enjoying the wonderful views on the way down as well from the energy. Roberto would have definitely something to add to that as well. Um, I don't think so. I think that's very thorough and I like the analogy with the marathon and climbing up and down. That is a, that's a much nicer analogy than the uh, running the marathon one, which I have heard. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a, a that you create a good picture with that. <laughs> There's already a question in which I'm delighted about. Um, so it's a really good question. It says, I'm, I'm keen to find out about prehabilitation and post-surgery um, diet for a diabetic. Um, what would be your advice? Um, shall I go? Would you like to go? Uh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. All right. Okay. So, um, so first of all, uh, prehabilitation uh, is actually a multimodal complex intervention. And what we tend to mean by prehabilitation, because your question is specifically related to diet, and that's why I'm just using this opportunity to explore a little bit more, is that it is a combination primarily of three modalities, exercise, psychological support, 
and the dietetics and nutritional intervention. And they all go hand in hand because there is a huge amount of interplay. If you see, if you're building up your muscle mass reserve, and then you need, and also, uh, you know, you also then need to supplement the need for that muscle mass uh, reserve for, by eating enough protein in your diet. Um, now, the reason there is a lot of wonderful advice available, which is out there when it comes to diet and cancer and nutrition. Um, but for prehabilitation, and for any specific case scenario, we have to actually conduct a full medical assessment, which looks at your blood markers, such as if you mentioned diabetes and things like glycosylated hemoglobin, which is a specific marker, which looks at how your blood glucose has been over the last few months. We look at whether you've had any weight loss or not had any weight loss. Uh, we look at how your hand grip strength is because all of these are interrelated and then start giving you specific advice, which is related. But all I can say, the recommendations, which can be generic is A, to eat a varied diet, very lots of healthy diet. B, if you can, try and avoid processed foods. I mean, there is a lot of awareness right now about eating natural, healthy meals, which which are very difficult uh, to sometimes make when you have so much on your plate. But if you can, that's why I always advise to eat natural food. And third is to ensure that you have enough protein intake um, because you need the protein in your diet to help make up for the muscle breakdown that will happen as a result of whether it's in cancer or cancer's treatment itself as well. Um, for anything else, I think it would be extremely prudent to have a whole prehab assessment and a screening and then tailor the support to your needs. Thank you. Um, there's another question actually that's kind of related from somebody who says oh, I've got some other health conditions in addition to my recent bowel cancer and this is one that comes up a lot actually to me in my clinical practice when I'm encouraging people to be more active before um, their treatment begins um, and they're asking would I still be suitable to join a prehab program? Oh absolutely absolutely what we have to realize is that first of all we have to remember that our cells and I you know our patients your cells or anyone else we don't come in neat little packages you know we don't just come in oh, yes we've now got bowel cancer we also have over our life accumulated either certain things like we call comorbidities, which are things like high blood pressure, we may have anemia, we may have heart disease, we may have, some of us have got asthma. Um, and on top of that, we then get the devastating diagnosis of cancer. And then also we don't come in with the same fitness level to the cancer treatment program as well. Hence, it's very important to have a targeted and individualized and personalized exercise program. And there is increasing global acceptance in the medical community. And Claire, your patients would have benefited that anyone can participate in prehabilitation and everyone's needs are different. So you might be a 75 year old chap who gets a diagnosis of bowel cancer, but you still go ahead. You are still playing, let's say, five games of tennis a week then perhaps the impetus then and the focus then is on the psychological and the dietetics prehabilitation. Or you might be someone who has had a sedentary lifestyle, whether that's because of your occupation or life circumstances, then the focus is again, a little bit more intensive coaching when it comes to exercise, because, um, and Roberto will obviously support me in this. We don't have time when we get diagnosis of cancer amongst exercise. We don't usually tell people that we need to do, a, you know, we have two years for building up the muscle mass to go ahead for the treatment. We have a small period of window available, but we know from enough research that even three weeks or two weeks are enough to make start making small differences. And for that, you need guidance on what exercise to do, how often to do it, what is the different combination, repeat assessments at regular intervals so that it can be altered. Um, Roberto, would you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I think I think just as a very quick summary, the, the idea is that um, if we um, could face a multimodal rehabilitation program, uh, there is not just one component, there is not just physical activity or nutrition or, or psychological support, there are many things. So even if you couldn't do one thing, you can always have the other aspects of the program. So, so really 
prehabilitation, uh, almost everybody can find something within a program that can be useful for them. Um, and also at this point, worth adding, besides these three important elements, another thing that prehabilitation helps us to try and help look at lifestyle factors. If you need support with giving up smoking, if you need support with cutting down on alcohol, some advice about sleep, some advice about other small things that might be necessary, signposting to what else is available. Prehabilitation is a very comprehensive service and tailored to your needs. Thank you. Okay, so I think that really answers the question. And someone else, else had asked, is it safe for me to start exercising after my re recent diagnosis if I haven't been active? And what you're saying is just seek advice, get personalised advice. It's great for everybody to start exercising. It just needs to be tailored. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, so we've got another question. Um that says, I start long course um, key, uh, chemo radiotherapy in about two weeks. Is it possible to make a difference in this short period of time? That's a great question. Um, okay, I, I can take that for everyone. Um, I think um, definitely it would be good to start now. Um, you may find that it may not make a huge difference in two weeks, but the idea about rehabilitation during cancer treatment like chemotherapy is that uh, you may not find a difference at the very beginning, but usually when you go through chemo, um, you find that some of the side effects are increased fatigue, um, uh, well, lack of energy, um, your, your sleep might not be there. Um, you feel, well, there are many things. It's a, a whole lot of things that can um, affect your lifestyle doing the prehabilitation program and including things like physical activity activity regularly what it does is, is um allows you to to keep your let's say quality of life so uh, by the end of the treatment if you didn't do anything if you didn't do a prehab then you will find yourself in a situation um, that would be probably a, a bit complex uh, but if you did something like prehab then it could help you overcome all those side effects quite quite better so you know, I would say, yeah, if you have two weeks, you can start uh, definitely during the treatment, you would like to continue being active and doing all the all the uh, healthy, well, all the health related um, aspects within the prehabilitation program. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Thank you. And I think people do worry, don't they, about the short period of time, but actually the benefits of the exercise and the psychological benefit is huge, isn't it? And yeah. um, we've got another couple of questions come in. Um, so, hi, how do I get prehab assessment? Um, I was diagnosed with a kidney cancer today, um, partial nephrectomy in October, um, and I have a rectal tumour treatment to be decided, um, and they'd really like to access um, prehab. Um, so, I mean, you should, there are prehabilitation services which are available as part of National Health Service. And um, so, for example, we, for any patient who lives in Kenton Medway, uh, the southeast county of England, if they get diagnosed with cancer, we are able to offer them prehabilitation services. Uh, there are similar services which are uh, which your oncologist or your clinical nurse specialist should be able to guide if there is one available in your area you should be able to access them. I would definitely raise this as a question to your clinical nurse specialist because they are very aware of lots of supportive services which are uh, your cancer nurse specialists are available in your area. And if there's a prehab service, they should be able to guide you. Um, and I mean, I, it would help, and I don't want to identify, so let's not ask about where you are in the UK and all, but I think your CNS would be the way to go ahead to find out. And once referred, then you should have a, a very quick appointment available to you, should the prehab service be available, because we know time is extremely precious. And then you have a screening, and then you have a prehab program which is prescribed for you that you're able to follow through. Um, and in our practice, and we've offered this to our um, around a thousand above a thousand patients so far and um, we offer then follow-ups at three months to make sure that everything is okay and everything is you are on track and if there is any additional support that is required and then we are also able to signpost you to any if you want that to pre-existing services within the community which your local councils might offer such as walking groups cycling groups swimming groups should you want to carry on with that healthy lifestyle and why wouldn't you after you've been through such a 
brilliant life-changing event with the support of prehab. Thank you. It's tricky, isn't it? Because we know that the, uh, not everybody has an excellent service yet. Um, so, yeah, I think you're quite right. Bring it up with your specialist nurse. Um, and if they don't have formalised prehabilitation services, um, they ought to be able to, to find a way to, to, to for you to access prehabilitation before. Um, even if it's that you have some good discussions, they will have very motivated excellent physios dietitians um psychotherapists so they will have the components of it um ideally they'll have a prehab service um but we we know that it's not yet equitable everywhere um there's another question and i'll i'll read this out if if i may um so it's, I was diagnosed um, with stage three slash three B um, sigmoid colorectal cancer in November, 2021, following five days of pelvic radiotherapy in February, 22, and chemo from March to August, 2022. I had a bowel resection in February, 23, and I've worn a stoma bag ever since this date. I used to do basic yoga pre-op, but only managed walking after the operation. On Monday, I'm scheduled to have my ileostomy reversed. That's great. Um, my advice regarding exercise and preparing mentally. Any advice, um, please, for regarding exercising and preparing mentally for the reversal? Um, all right. Do you want to go? Shall I go? No, you had started, so please. Okay. Um, good. So, yeah, definitely congratulations on, on having the, the reversal schedule. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know that it can take a long time, and it's something that everybody is looking forward to have done. Um, so yeah, that's that's good news. Um, I would say the most important thing after the reversal would be uh, to take it easy when it comes to physical activity. You need to take some time uh, to make sure that everything is is healed properly before you engage into with anything uh, very intense. <clears throat> and then uh, maybe four or six weeks after the operation, you can start start thinking about some gentle um, abdominal exercises to strengthen the area. That's probably the most important if you want to reduce the risk, the risk of having a hernia or similar. Uh, but yeah, I would say take it easy, don't rush things, uh, and always have a lot of, you know, use a lot of common sense. If you do something that is uh, painful or uh, bothers you, then uh, stop and, you know, wait a few more days and try again, but always very slowly. I think it does also psychologically, I think you had asked and mentally, and I think it shows remarkable resilience that you're here tonight, despite having gone through such a long journey. And uh, I think so. Uh, what we tend to find is that people, so we tend to offer one-to-one -one counseling for patients within our prehab service. And I know it is not available for everyone everywhere, but from our experience and what our counselors tell us is that breathing exercises, and you can look up on YouTube NHS breathing exercises, they have definitely helped, not just in increasing and helping with the lung capacity, but also in calming some and psychologically getting something down. Um, the anxiety levels and stress levels, visualization techniques, um, and then, you know, guided meditation. These now, you know, it's very difficult without a guide to do guided meditation, but visualization and breathing exercises are something you can adapt in your daily life. Um, my one advice would be, and this especially is relevant to anyone, to all of us, you know, when we're trying to calm down anxiety, there are anxiety coping mechanisms. Some people like to just sit down and count the buildings they can see out of the window. There are some people who like to visualize that they are flooded in a wonderful light. Do practice them every day. Because then you're it is almost creating a muscle memory for your brain. And when you know, when you start visualize, when you start sitting down, doing your breathing exercises and counting the buildings, the brain knows that now I'm going to relax and I'm going to, it's almost practicing it every day. Because on the morning of the operation, if you're doing it for the first time, it will not have much impact probably. Because, you know, so if you can just squeeze out. 10 minutes out of your day and then practice this kind of anxiety coping mechanisms. Listen, even simple things like sitting down, looking at this gorgeous, beautiful sunshine right now, looking outside at nature and listening to your favorite song. Just practice that for 10 minutes, I'll just focus, switch off and focus. And if you practice it every day, 
then you can do it on the morning of the operation or the morning of the first chemo appointment. And that will help you calm down too. That's practice as well. Fantastic advice. Thank you. Now I'm aware we're getting near to eight o'clock, but we're a bit late starting. I've got two more questions. So if it's okay with you both, I'd just like to get through those. Yes. So um, the first one is my husband is determined to carry on with his regular sporting activities. I'm worried he's overdoing it. Um, and I don't want him to make himself more unwell. How do I make sure he's looking after himself? And can I speak to his healthcare team to ask what he shouldn't be doing? <laughs> Your um, husband's doing well, I think, but I won't. I, it's not me that's answering. Go on. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say that is uh, it's very particular. A lot of people really they worry about somebody overdoing things, but I would say if somebody's been used to being physically active and they enjoy it and they they feel okay doing it, I would say that's okay. If you know during the treatment at some point they feel like they cannot carry on or they need to ease up, then they will do it. Um, my experience is, is showed me that even uh, the, the fittest person, let's say going through something like chemo or radiotherapy, they feel the side effects, they will feel fatigue, and they will uh, intuitively and naturally uh, reduce the intensity or accommodate to the exercise they can do. Um, so for as long as somebody can do things, I would say, go on, um, and then they, they will be seeing you know, what, what's, what's going on. Thank you. That's right. Just got time for one quick last one. So I'm having difficulty sleeping, struggling mm. to fall asleep, often waking up a few times at night. I then feel tired in the day and have been taking naps. Um, do you have any ideas of what I can do to get better sleep? And is it okay to nap when I feel like it? Okay. Um, I, I'll go first, Tara, if you want. Um, obviously, Tara has mentioned things like visualization exercises, breathing exercises, mindfulness, guided yeah, meditation. All those things can contribute to having a better sleep if you do them before going to bed. Uh, well, obviously, in, in this context, we don't know whether uh, this particular person is going through chemotherapy or through some, some sort of treatment. Those treatments may affect as well your sleep and your, the quality of your sleep. So that's something we, we don't know. Um, but there are some things that you may want to look into. Um, usually, the, the room temperature it should be something around uh, 19, 20 degrees Celsius not too hot, not too cold. You may want to look at having uh, blinds so you have really dark uh, atmosphere when you are trying to sleep, uh, trying to prevent any any noise. Um, maybe uh, other things you can do is um, avoid um, screens, your phone or the television before going to bed, maybe an hour before going to bed. Switch off everything that has any screen that's blue light and blue light messes up with our, our circadian rhythms and how we sleep. So that would be a good thing. Stop uh, screen exposure before going to bed. And so people find very useful reading a book, uh, whether it's a physical book or it's a Kindle, uh, you can do that. And well, in my particular case, I, I don't get through one page because it's very effective for me, uh, but you know, you can try those things. I think you'll find that if, first of all, it's okay to take a nap. Definitely okay. No one's going to say no. Yeah, you can. Um, early supper also helps. There's enough, like, you know, if you are have a supper earlier in the day as well. And if you're able to engage in some amount of physical activity and exercise, that would be really good too, because that helps with the sleep process as well. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but in during the, as a, if you don't have access to a prehab service and you're wondering what amount of physical activity, the government recommendation, the chief medical officer's recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate activity a week, which is 30 minutes, five days a week. And uh, moderate activities that, um, you know, things like fast walking uh, and, uh, you know, bicycling, swimming, something that gets you a little bit puffy, but you're still able to have a conversation with a friend. And on top of it, we should be doing two day, two sessions of a resistance training a week as well. So that is the requirement for all adults so that we can counteract against muscle mass loss, which contributes to frailty later on in life. Um, now, as the demand on our body increases, so does the need. And that's why it's very important to tailor the intervention to your particular physiological capacity. Um, but the chief medical officer's guidance of 150 minute moderate activity a week with two sessions of uh, resistance training is a good aid memoir if we want to know at least how much we should be doing as we get through 
thing as well. Thank you both very much. We've had some excellent questions this evening. I, I think we are going to have to end it there because it's just after eight o'clock. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your expertise so generously and um, with us this evening for answering all the questions that have come your way and for the fantastic resource um, that you've made available to so many people. Um, we are very, very grateful to you.